Well, let's, let's bow before the Lord as we begin. Feel free to, to pray together with me in song. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies, they never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. O Lord, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Father, teach us your ways. Teach us your word, your statutes, your testimonies, your commandments. Uh, give us a hunger to know you more and more, to trust you more, to love you more, to serve you and your people. In the name which is above every name we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Well, good to see you again, and thank you, Pastor Jason, for uh, the opportunity to teach on prayer. Now, I've, I've, I've uh, focused our attention on personal prayer because that does come before corporate prayer, but it's both. The Lord taught us to pray. The Bible teaches us to pray personally. We're going to look at a lot of that tonight from the Psalms and especially Psalm 119. But when the disciples, well, the disciple is unnamed in Luke 11, after Jesus had come back from a time of prayer, he said, teach us to pray. And the Lord gave him what we call the Lord's Prayer. And it's a corporate prayer. Our Father. Uh, and of course, that uh, teaches us a couple of things. One, what I've been emphasizing, trying to with you, that is that the primary purpose of prayer is fellowship with God, a conversation with God, to know Him more. Well, the same thing is with corporate prayer. When we pray together, we're experiencing the deepest level of fellowship you can in the presence of the Lord. And God loves that. And so you don't do one or the other, but you do start with personal prayer and then can experience fellowship with God with others, with, with His people. But for our, our time, and of course I talk about some of that in the little booklet, and, if, and if, there's, if you still want one, Robbie has the file. Just talk to Robbie and he can make you uh, another a little booklet on prayer. And I'm just teaching out of it. I'm not able to cover everything that's in there, but uh, some of the things. Okay, so personal prayer is what we've been talking about. Primarily, fellowship with God. Now, of course, we ask God to do things that only God can do. But we want to respond to Him in prayer. He takes initiative in prayer. So we need to learn to listen to Him. Now, one of the great books on this is uh, Eugene Peterson's Answering God. He wrote, uh, he wrote a lot about what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, just one of the many people that have of the ancient practice of praying the Psalms. And that's what we're going to get to. But we need to learn to listen so that we can pray back to God what He says to us. 
We were just singing about uh, the promises of God. And Pastor Jason talking about the promises of God. And so we, we know the promises of God. So we pray the promises of God. We pray back to Him what He has promised to do. And when we do that, we are in agreement with God. We join Him. It's what Jesus was talking about in John 14 through 17 about mutual indwelling, being one with the Father and the Father in us and then Jesus in us and He in the Father. And we are in agreement. It's what Paul talks about when walking in the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, not in the flesh. We want to be in agreement. And that's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus, being in agreement with Him. Well, first of all, you need to know what you're agreeing to. So that's why it's important to develop your spiritual sense of hearing and seeing and tasting, all of that, all of your spiritual senses. I believe there's more than five the spiritual senses. I don't know what they all are, but at least those that, that we engage in responding to the Word of God by faith. And that's how we hear. Now, real quick... Uh, you, when, you, when you're agreeing with God, what He has said, you've heard Him, you're praying it back, His will is done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the line from the Lord's Prayer. And God doesn't need our involvement. He wants to share that with us. Oh, I've got a great story on that. I'll, I'll save it. <laughs> Say, no, I'll tell it. One of my earliest memories was standing on our back porch, summertime, watching my dad, Dick Stahl, mow the backyard with one of those old mowers, push mowers. No motor, just push. And I was standing there watching him, thinking, that so, looks like so much fun. <laughs> Look at that. He stopped looked at me, smiled, and gave me this. I jumped off that porch. It's one of my earliest memories, probably four or five, maybe, maybe four. Ran through that tall St. Augustine grass, grabbed a hold of those handles up high, and we started mowing that backyard. Oh, so, that grass falling on my legs. And going, and his sweat was dropping on me. He said, Daddy, sweat a lot. And so, man, I was sweating. Now, let me ask you something. Who was mowing? Huh? You think he was the only one mowing? I was mowing. He was mowing, but so was I. He was doing the heavy lifting. There's no question of that. But he was sharing the joy of it with me. And, uh, and we had a big glass of iced tea after it was over with. Okay, well, the Father invites us to join him in what he's doing. And what's our part? Joy. It's just pure joy. He's doing the heavy lifting. He's doing the work. But he shares the joy. Now, all the illustrations break down later. I didn't want to do that anymore, but I said, you, know, you know how that goes. Just an illustration. Okay, so we need to learn to pray the promises of God and your promises. Now, this is where one of the things that I've learned by learning to pray from the Scripture is the Scripture gives us promises to make to God. We hesitate to do that because of our sinful condition. I don't, I don't keep my promises. As I said last week, you don't hear that at a wedding, though. You don't hear somebody say, wait a minute, I'm going to keep my promises too good. Oh, don't. No, don't. You will. Yes, you will. <laughs> and, of course, so help me God. But also I've heard people say, no, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, just let your yes be yes and your no. No, he's, he's not talking about making a promise. He's talking about strengthening. He's, he's saying, you don't need to strengthen your word by saying, oh, I swear on a stack of Bibles. No, you don't have to do that. Just speak the word, and your word is strong enough. Just tell the truth. So he's not saying, don't make promises. Or you might say, well, what about uh, uh, like in Proverbs? It's actually in chapter 20-something. 20, 20 
uh, 20, verse 20 something, you know, uh, don't be too rash to call this is holy, but consider before you make a vow. Well, yeah, you want to make sure that the promises that you make to God come from the scripture. And that's the whole point of this class. Learning to pray from the word of God, allowing God's word to shape your conversation with him. And in doing that, you will develop that ear as you are obedient. By the way, obedience is the number one way to make progress in hearing God. Or let me put it this way. Disobedience, you're out of fellowship with him. Not, you don't lose a relationship. The prodigal son is still a son, but he was out of fellowship with the father in his disobedience. And so obedient. But when you pray, you're being obedient. You are responding to the invitation of God to join Him in what He desires to do in you, with you, through you, as you before the Father and the watching world around you. Okay, so we want to tackle or be tackled by... (laughs) Psalm 119 and the other 149 psalms tonight to try to come up with a plan. This is probably the most practical part of the three-part series on uh, learning to pray. Of course, you know the book of Psalms is the prayer book of the Bible. It's prayers. Uh, Most are directly to God, but all, whether directly to God or talking about God, whenever you talk about God, make sure you're talking to God about God. Which, by the way, that was the difference between Job and his three friends. His three friends just talked about God. Job talked about God to God. And uh, we'll go go there another time. But tonight, the book of Psalms. Now, this is an ancient, ancient practice I share with you. Of course, all through... Uh, the Old Testament saints, the, uh, before Christ, the Jewish people practiced this praying the Psalms and still today and believers also continued uh, this practice. But the one we want to start with is Psalm 119 because it's the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. It's the longest prayer in the Bible uh, the first three verses are, are not a prayer, but the first three verses describe a person who is learning this prayer. Blessed are those whose way are blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. It is a prayer about God's Word and the value of it in my life in prayer. Oh, it's a, it's a treasure chest. It is a gold mine. Now, open your Bible to Psalm 119 and notice how there it is divided up into 22 eight-verse sections. Now, if yours is not divided up into an eight-verse section, well, go to the bookstore tomorrow and get one that is... <laughs> Notice, what is the heading right above verse 1? Aleph. Aleph, yeah, Aleph or Aleph. That's the Hebrew letter A. It's the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Look down in front, on top of verse 9. What does it say? Beth. 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 That's the second letter, Beth. And up next to verse 17, Gimel. Yeah, that's like, this is like the ABCs. This prayer is arranged with the Hebrew alphabet, every section, every eight verse section is dedicated to that letter. Now in Hebrew, you don't see it in English, but in Hebrew, the first word in each verse begins with that letter. And and it's, you know, that's just a kind of trivial thing, but the writer, probably David, was saying, my vocabulary cannot exhaust the value of God's word as I pray it. Now, the, the, as we talk about praying the Psalms, when you come up to this one, you say, good grief, 186 verses, I'm 176 verses, how can, I, how can I pray that? Take one section a week, 
for example, and have that as a supplement to your prayer time. And as we'll see, a supplement to the psalm that you're going to pray. And begin your time of prayer in God's Word. Allow God to begin your prayer time each day, whether it's in the morning, whether it's morning, noon, and evening, however many times you, are, you pause to pray, let God's Word begin the conversation. So uh, let's just think about it. Here's, here's uh, uh, 22 sections, and you're going to take uh, one a week, Okay to supplement, or you could do, uh, uh, yeah, one a week. So how many weeks? Of course, that'd be 22 weeks. That's about five months. So here's what you can do with this prayer. It's all a personal prayer. Uh, each section will address something particular. Usually the first line will give you a hint as to what that whole section is addressing. But you can pray this in your prayer time as something to begin your time of prayer with. God's Word will start the conversation. Now here's another thing you can do. When you, when you do this for a week, notice a verse that kind of stands out that morning as you pray. And if there's not one, just take the next one. Just take the first one. And these are pretty much short verses, and memorize that verse before you're done with your prayer time. Now, the, now here's three words to, for memory, the three key words for memorizing: repetition, concentration, and understanding. We know we're repetition, the words say it over and over and over again. Read it, I don't know, five times, looking at it. One verse. Cover it up. If you can't say it five times, then take your hand off and say it out loud five times again. <laughs> if nothing else, you'll get so tired of that drill, you'll start concentrating on it to get it. <laughs> That's another story. I'll, I'll leave it alone. because it... No. So a guy came to me. He said, I've got a terrible habit. What is it? He said, I cuss all the time. I can't stop. And I had just happened to be reading a method like the dog thing with Pavlo's dog. He said, yeah, he said, if you want to break a habit, put a big rubber band on your wrist, and every time you do what you don't want to do, pop yourself. <laughs> so I was just wondering if that would work. So I told this guy, I said, well, look. And he had just kind of a constraint. I said, get, get a rubber band, put it around your wrist. Every time you say a bad word, pop yourself. <laughs> really? I said, yeah. Next week he came back. I was curious. I said, did it work? He said, man, I went home and I found the thickest rubber band I could find. Could hardly wait till the next morning. Sure enough, man, I came out with a bad word. I popped myself. He said, good grief, I had to pop myself five more times before I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> but finally I stopped. <laughs> and he said, it worked. It worked. Well, maybe that's a good takeaway for you tonight. I don't know if that's a problem you have, but, uh, but memorize, memorize that verse, one verse. Now, if you have trouble memorizing, it's not a mental problem. Most of the time, it's a concentration problem. But it can also be a heart problem. Remember my story about meeting Beth? I mean, looking, at, looking across the room and... She, Seeing her look at me, she says there's another version of this. <laughs> but when she, gave, when she gave me her name, I didn't have to ask her twice. I had it. And when she gave me her number, I didn't have to ask her twice. And I'm not good with numbers. If you have trouble memorizing Scripture, ask God to give you a greater love for Him, for His Word, desiring to remember what He is saying. And here's what you can do at that verse. You actually can take your quiet time with you then throughout the day and be praying that verse uh, throughout the day. And the next day, you can take another one. Now, the purpose is not to quote it to somebody. The purpose is to pray it to God. 
Now, it'll also come out in your speech, when your conversation with other people, too, without even realizing it. So, you're going to take one section a week and begin your time of prayer. And in about a week, you can actually have memorized that section. And if you can't, don't worry about it. Just take a verse. Take a part of that verse and put it in your heart as before you uh, conclude your prayer time. And that quietness, that quiet time will be in you and go with you uh, where you go. Okay, now here's the other thing you can do to begin your, your time of prayer. And that is take one psalm a day. Read it. Pray it as best you can, and then think about it. Like we'd say, meditate on that. Along with your one section, you can start with either one. Start with Psalm 119 section, or start with the psalm for the day, but read it, pray it, and then meditate. What does it say about God? What does this just say? What did it just this just say about me? What does this say about people that I'm praying for? And because as you know, the, the prayers of the book of Psalms cover the full gamut of our experience uh, here on earth. And uh, chances are, as you read that psalm, and most psalms are very, very short. Some are, you know, longer, but most of them are six, eight, sixteen verses long. So you're going you're gonna to do one psalm a day. Now, here's how I keep track of that. I'll start Psalm 1 on the first day of the month. For example, if this was October 1st, just go Psalm 1 on October 1st. There's 150 psalms. That's five months. You will have, you, you start over. Now, the way I keep track, like today, I was on Psalm 95 because it's October the 5th. But I started back in uh, July, I think. And, and, and so you, you go through a five-month cycle, make sure that the last number of the psalm matches the day of the month. And that's how I remember it. <laughs> so you're doing one psalm a day. Now, you get to, uh, you have months that have 31 days, you're going to do that psalm twice. Let's just take an example. Let's say that you're going to start October 1st. Of course, you're already, but don't, and if you miss a day, don't do double. Just, just stay with where you are. The point of this is not so that you say, oh boy, I read and prayed through the whole book of Psalms. No, the point is that every day you're allowing God's word to start the conversation. When you miss a meal, you don't eat double the next meal. You just make sure you don't miss another meal. <laughs> if you miss a quiet time, and we all do, you miss a quiet time for whatever reason, your regular time with God in that regular place, don't, you, you can't make up for it. And we've tried doing that, and what happens? We get further and further behind, and we just give it up. That's why the book of Genesis and Exodus are the most, two read, most read two books of the Bible. <laughs> get into Leviticus and you no, oh, great, God, no way. What is that? You kidding me? <laughs> That's what Leviticus means. In the, no, it doesn't. In Hebrew. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Pastor. I'm sorry. <laughs> let, me, let me get back on course here. So tomorrow morning, you're going to read and pray Psalm 6. Six. Okay. Going to go through October 31st, what psalm are you going to be on? 31. Psalm 31. November the 1st, do Psalm 31 again so that you stay with it. Now, when you get to February, and by the way, you will end in, the, in February. You will be at, the, at Psalm 148 on February 28. Here's what you do. Do two psalms that night, that day or that night, whether you're in the morning or evening. So you do 28, 29, and then you're going to start over March the 1st by doing Psalm 50, 150, and Psalm 1 to, 
to kick it off again for March the 1st. Now, I explained that in the booklet. I explained it a little bit on the notes, but I know it can be con confusing sometimes. But the thing I want you to do, because if you didn't have the supplement of 119, whenever you got to that one, you'd say, oh, no, I don't have two hours here. <laughs> So you'll be, so when you do get to Psalm 119 on the schedule, you already have the section, the eight verse section that you're doing, and that becomes your psalm prayer for the day. Now, here's the other thing you can do. Psalms is praying, is, is God's word to us to say to him. Proverbs is God's word from him to you, his child. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 3. I mean, you, you, you just, I mean, that's just an example, but you, you know the book of Proverbs. Now, some people will do a proverb a day, 31 days. I, I like Jace, Pastor Jason's description of drinking from a fire hose. But if you take about four to six verses of Proverbs, you can divide the book of Proverbs, oh, there's 900 and something verses, you can divide the book of Proverbs up into 150 readings that will supplement your Psalm 119 reading, your Psalm reading and prayer, and then go to Proverbs and hear God talking to you. Look at, someone read Proverbs 3. Oh, we're very familiar with it, but uh, just read verse 1 through 4. My son, do not forget my teaching. Keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. That love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Can you hear God talking to you, his child, with those verses? The whole book of Proverbs is like that. It is the Father speaking to his child. Now, I know it says my son, and ladies, don't get bent out of shape about that. Us men have to worry about being called the bride. You know what I mean? <laughs> you have to get over that. No, we're his children. We are born from above. He is our father. And so the book of Proverbs, and I've seen that taking just four or five, six no more than that. You divide it up. And by the way, in my little booklet back in the back, I think it's Appendix 1, I've given you that guide of praying the Psalms and the section of Proverbs. But you've got to mark it in your own Bible so that on day 31, you've got 31 written by chapter 3, verse 4 or 5 or whatever it happens to be. So that the next time you go through, it's already marked. Your Proverbs is already marked. Now, by the way, you can also do this with readings from the Gospels. There's uh, about five months worth of Gospel and Acts readings that you can do. Uh, I wrote this little book, True Worship, back uh, several years ago, and, I, and this, this book is about what I'm talking to you about tonight, along with daily... Uh, a little, just a little devotional. But the main thing about the book is the reading schedule of a psalm a day, a section from Proverbs, a section from the Gospel, a section from the, the letters, along with a section from either the Law, the Prophets, or the Writings. So that in five months, you will have prayed the Psalms and Proverbs, you will have read the New Testament and one of either the law, the prophets, or the writings. So that in 15 months, you'll have read the New Testament three times, prayed the Psalms three times, good grief, and covered the whole Old Testament. You can even do it in five months if you have a half a day or so. <laughs> that information right there is worth $15 of the book if you, bought, if you ordered it on Amazon. <laughs> Pastor Jason talked about having a regular reading schedule. You need one. You've got to have something, a coach, to guide you through, or you won't do it. And obedience opens your ear and your eyes 
to see and hear what God is saying and doing in you so that you can join Him, be one with Him, and be in agreement with Him. Okay, so I'm just saying that this is, becomes a guide. Your prayer time becomes a guide for, and I always I tell people, I tell this to pastors where, in, in other countries where I go, always read the gospel. Something, always see what Jesus is doing there. You say, well, I already know that story. Oh, <laughs> no, you, no, we don't. <laughs> you know how that goes. Man, I've been read this a hundred times and I never saw that. And so always, every day, make sure that you are listening and watching Jesus as well as hearing what his life in you looks like. I mean, you know, the Old Testament promises and prophesies the coming of Christ, every bit of it. It looks forward, promising, prophesying Christ. The Gospels present Christ. Here he is. The book of Acts proclaims Christ. Man, I remember when Dan, our youngest son, he went to Hardin Simmons. I knew he had to take New Testament and Old Testament. So the first semester he took New Testament. Ah, okay. So coming home for Thanksgiving, I said, okay, we're going to have some shop talk, you know, some Bible. Tell me about New Testament, Dan. Oh, man, I like it. Well, how's the, where are you? We're in the book of Acts. Okay. Well, how is your professor looking at Acts? I know he kind of gave me that look like, you're giving me a test or what? What's he doing? He said, we're looking at it from the sermons. Oh, yeah, it's a good way. That's basic. So what have you learned about the sermons? He said, well, Daddy, uh, Peter preached one of the shortest sermons in Acts. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were saved. Stephen preached the longest sermon in Acts, and they killed him at the end. <laughs> when he gave the invitation, they killed him. Then he just looked at me. <laughs> it was one of the nicest ways to say, you preach too long, Daddy. <laughs> you should start preaching shorter. Well, seriously, the book of Acts proclaims Christ. The letters from Romans to Jude explain what the life of Christ looks like in you. And, of course, the book of uh, uh, Revelation promises his return. That being said, every day in the Word, but the clearest is New Testament, presenting Christ, hearing the proclamation of Christ, the preaching and the power of that Word going out, and then explaining what does His life look like, sound like, act like, feel like. In me, because he is in, in me. And then, of course, getting through the Old Testament is just, it's just it's three times as long, and so you can, you can do it. But for sure, start with your prayer time and allow God to set that prayer time. Now, in doing that, now it's awkward at first because we all have a, a way that we pray. Now, for the longest time, I felt like the way I prayed <laughs> was similar to the way I discovered people looking at H-E-B. Because once I retired, one of the things that I told Beth, I'm going to help you now. I haven't helped you for 40 years, but now I'm going to begin. I want to go to the grocery store for you. Oh, thank you, she said. I said, no, I want to go. I don't know where any of that stuff is, but I'm going to do it. So I got her list. I started walking the aisles. And then I, and I started learning because Beth would send me the prayer, uh, the prayer list, the grocery list <laughs> with where the item is in H-E-B, aisle 17, and a picture of it. Well, that became very... <laughs> Because I was bringing things that weren't, I mean, it would be, you know, tea, but it wouldn't be the right kind of tea, okay? Well, then I started noticing, I started enjoying watching people. Most people walk through H-E-B the way they walk through life. <laughs> you, try that next time you're there. Just notice how, what people do when they walk those aisles. That's the way I prayed for the longest time. Just kind of, 
But, uh, yeah. yeah, and then I start thinking about something else. And I stopped talking to God and I was talking to myself. Allowing God's Word to shape your prayer may be a, a bit awkward at first, but beloved, I want to tell you, it will be an experience that you are sad that you have to go on to the next thing of the day. And you will schedule a day of prayer in your calendar in three days a year, if you possibly can. You say, well, I just don't... I just can't make that kind of time. We don't make time. We, you don't, you don't, you, you make time by sacrificing something. <laughs> you, you'll never have the time to do this unless you make that time. And you can make time for, and we do, for things that are important. And beloved, there is nothing more valuable. There is nothing more important than hearing what God wants to say to you today. And all of the ways that he says, I love you, I love you, I love you, is in his word. And then you can say that uh, back to him in prayer. And it takes a little bit of time. And this is an ancient, ancient practice. And uh, I highly recommend it. Okay, well... One of the things that you'll learn, again, as you allow, especially Psalm 119, you'll notice that uh, very few requests, actually, compared to the length of it. Now, there are requests, and some sections are just nothing but requests. Take a look at uh, uh, the, fifth le the, the fifth letter, hey, I guess it would be about... Uh, 119, uh, yeah, 33. Okay, someone read verse 33. All right. Okay, there's a request with a promise. Teach me your statutes and I will. I will. That's a promise. So there's requests that have a promise attached. Now remember, back again, whenever you make a promise to God, make sure it's from the Scripture. And always with John 15, 5, apart from you, Lord, I can do nothing. A promise, when we make our promises to God, they're actually veiled requests of, I will keep your statutes. And of course, don't think of performance that with keep. We're, we're in such a performance-oriented society. We have to perform. Keep does mean obey, but it means more than that. It means to value. It means to recognize the importance. It means to go that direction. It is going with God in His statutes. Keeping His Word is walking in the Spirit. Walking with God in His Word. Saying, you know what? I'm going to go with you, God. Because your Word is eternal. I will keep your statutes. Is in essence saying, Lord, I know you're with me, but I want you to know I'm with you. I'm going with you. I'm going to go with you. I will keep. When God told Adam to tend and keep the garden, tend means to work, but it's also used for worship. It's service to tend it, to work it, and to keep it. To recognize the value of this, of this planted, controlled environment where Adam and Eve are going to learn to have dominion over all of creation. Amen. Well, uh, back to keep. To value this place. To value His Word. Okay, Every verse is a request. Next one, give me understanding that I may keep your law. Next one, lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Oh, that word delight is, is used to describe enjoying a meal. <laughs> we come out of this fellowship hall on Wednesday night, and we are, are the definition of that word. <laughs> that was so good. 
I was just, I just enjoyed it every bit. The banana pudding, good grief, are you kidding me? <laughs> I delight in it. The Hebrew word it has a delightful sound, shushua, shushua. It's a celebrative word. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servants your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precept. In your righteousness, give me life. Every one of those verses is a request. But now look at verse 97. The, uh, this would be the 13th uh, letter, Mim. We would call it M. Uh, someone read the first, uh, read verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Okay, is there a request there? Is, are you asking God to do anything? Like, uh, keep steady my steps according to your promise? No, it's just a declaration of truth. Oh, how I love your law. Now, you say, well... I, I, I don't really. Well, go ahead and say it. <laughs> What's the expression? Fake it till you make it. <laughs> no, you know that you want to. So go ahead and pray that. Oh, how I love your law. Well, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it. Thank you, God. Show me more. It's one of the prayers you've got to learn. Thank you, Father. Show me more. Uh, your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. Verse 98, is that a request? Every verse in this section is a declaration of truth. Most of Psalm 119 is that. Just like the prayer of Jesus in John 17. The seven, John 17 prayer, we talked about the five requests in it, maybe seven if you go that far. But most of those 26 verses is mirrored like in Psalm 119. It is declaration of truth. I have glorified you, Father, on earth. That's a declaration of truth. I have revealed your name to those you have given me. That's a declaration of truth. So one of the things that God's Word will do as, as it shapes your prayer is it will help you with confession. The confession of what God has said, because what God has said is true. And He will do it. And you confess. Now, we also confess our sins, and you need to. I know we have that song, count your blessings, name them one by count. I don't know why, it's not in the hymnal. Count your many sins, name them one by one. Count your many enemies, name them one by one. And you'll be amazed at what the Lord can do. <laughs> well, name your sin, but here's the important thing. One, ask for the gift of repentance, but get ready. It's different than just feeling sorry for your sins. It's different than being afraid you might get caught. The gift of repentance is devastating. I've had people tell me I didn't even want to, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't get out of bed. But it is a gift from God when He reveals to you lies that you have believed all along and you had no idea. And he reveals that, thank you, Father, show me more. But the important prayer in confession is, now teach me your way, and I will walk in your truth. That's a promise. Unite my heart to fear your name so, it was my, so that I can have a wholehearted. Here's a little Bible study for you to do. Go through there and trace the phrase wholehearted or with all my heart, all through the Scripture. Wow. And this becomes a prayer for you. With all my heart, I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love. I'm giving you Psalm 86, 11 through 13. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You've delivered my soul from the lowest hell. 
Ask the Lord to teach you a different way to respond to the temptation next time and get ready because it's coming quick. Both the lesson, He'll give you a word to teach you how to recognize that is a lie. I'm not going there. And He will teach you to go to Him when you're tempted. <laughs> Don't trust yourself. Just no confidence, just no confidence in, in yourself. Lead me not into temptation. Can't handle that. But we, when we are tempted, God is there. And His Word is there if we are learning from Him how to have an overcoming faith. And remember, it starts with obedience. But when you're praying, you're being obedient. Now, there are requests with results. Uh, this is with purpose clauses. Let's, uh, I think I've given you some examples there. Request with results. And what the results are, when you're praying a prayer with results. Look at verse 17. Psalm 119, verse 17. Someone read that. Yeah. No, no, somebody read that out loud. <laughs> okay, so re read it again. Okay, that I may is a result of being held continually. Verse 17 in uh, ESV says, deal bountifully with your servant, Lord, that I may live and keep your word. I think I mentioned that this, the Hebrew word deal bountifully literally means to be weaned. It describes a child that has gone from mother's milk to solid food. That's, that's bountiful. That's, that's God being good to me. Another way to say that is this. Give me spiritual growth, Lord. But here's the result. What's the result? That I may live and keep your word. When you, when you add a result to your request from God's word, He's already given you the answer. He's told you what the answer is. We're, we're not going to have time to go into the prison prayers of Paul, but it's a whole teaching of itself. The, the two prayers in Ephesians, the prayer in Philippians, the prayer in Colossians. But all of them have a single request. Well, the one in Colossians, a couple of But a single request with a number of answers. Uh, the first one, Psalm, uh, chapter, uh, Psalm Ephesians 1.15. It says, give... Paul was praying for the Ephesians, give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. That's the one request. Give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. So that, there's the request, so that the eyes of their heart will be enlightened. So that they may know what is the hope of your calling. What are the glorious riches of your inheritance in the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of your power toward those who believe? Power that raised Jesus from the dead. And see, you know, he just goes on to the end of the chapter. But the answer to the prayer is in the prayer. You don't have to wonder. Now, you don't, may not know when God will answer, but you know how what it will look like when the answer comes. You don't have to wonder. That's a request. And you recognize it with the little English word that or so that. You can see the request and then you can see the outcome uh, of that request. And you just say, thank you, God. Or you could take our prayer from Psalm 86. Uh, Teach me your way, O Lord, so that I may walk in your truth. That's the reason I want to learn your way. I uh, unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart to fear your name. 
uh, talking about uh, what Pastor Jason was talking about, the resurrection. That's one of the, the glorious things that will be so different, and yet so God will put us all together. You'll be unified. You will. Spirit, soul, and body. I'm the one, I'll go with the three-part guys. I'll, but seriously, no, you'll be unified. With your whole heart, you will love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your body, with all your strength. Okay, so the, the, uh, uh, the result of teach me your way and I will walk so that I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart. Why? To fear your name. That's why I want my heart to be united. And then he believes. I give you thanks with my whole heart. And I will glorify your name forever. All right, we're gonna get, we got to get uh, done, but I think we're done. Start with Psalm 6 tomorrow. Uh, go ahead and, you know, you can go to the second section. That's about a week into it. Uh, verse 9 through 16 of Psalm 119. Oh, how can a young man keep his way pure? Starts with a question. By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you, Lord. Let me not wander from your commandments. The verse that we know very well from this section. Your word I've hidden in my heart. Result, that I may not sin against you. So take that next section. Take that section. Let your prayer time begin. Then go to Psalm 6. Uh, read that. Pray that. Think about that. What is that saying? Take one of those verses from 9 to 16. Put it in your heart. Uh, repetition. Uh, concentration. Understanding. What is it saying? So that you can, uh, you can pray uh, throughout the day. All right. Well, we have got 30 seconds for a question. <laughs> but I do want to conclude with what Robbie put. And God bless Robbie for the way he does this. Uh, there is nothing more powerful, there is nothing more valuable than when you say a prayer for yourself. You join the Holy Spirit. He's praying for you constantly. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father praying for you. When you pray for yourself, you join them in the Word, the will of God that they are praying that he is praying. And you also give that valuable, exceedingly valuable, powerful gift. You cannot give a gift more powerful than when you pray for another person. I heard recently, a man said, I just, I just don't, I'm, I'm unproductive. I can't do anything anymore. I can't go. I can't do. I said, no, you can pray. Is there anything that you have ever done that has exceeded that? <laughs> Think of it. Never, never, never underestimate what God desires to do in you and with you and through you as you and I learn to pray. Okay, maybe a question. And don't worry, if it's too hard, I'll say, that question's so easy, I'm going to let Pastor Jason answer that one. <laughs> Anybody have a question? So, uh, uh, do you ever have occasions, now you talked about uh, organizing your prayer time, organizing your quiet time, uh, having a strategy, mm. but on occasion, do you get in a verse and God just sets you down right there and you can't go any further? Yes, did y'all hear the question? You have a strategy. You must. God's very organized. <laughs> uh, I teach pastors, talk about the Trinity, teach on the Trinity, and every time one of them will say, so what was God doing before creation? And before, one time, before I could answer, one of the other pastors said, he was planning. <laughs> <laughs> the organization, I mean, good grief, quantum mechanics. That's the mechanics of an atom. 
the three guys just won the Nobel Peace Prize on studying it, of what Einstein said, it's spooky. That's quoting Einstein. But that is an organization. It's organized. So yes, you must have an organization, a plan for your time with God. Couples know this. You know this. Study, any kind of study, you know this. So it is with God. But occasionally, God will just say, no, right here is where we need to stay. And Mike, that's what his question was. What do you do? I've, I've, been, I've camped out for a month on that one time, that one word, that one verse, and just couldn't stay with my plan because God has, and it'll be from his word. So yes, for sure. And you, now, and of course, you, you, you want to beware of becoming legalistic with this. And, and you know it becomes legalistic when God's not in the conversation. When you're just doing your, your thing and you get through, you close your Bible and get up and go. I'm glad that's over with. I'm, do, I'm done with that. I hope, hope somebody noticed. It's my quiet time today. <laughs> and you kind of look for maybe something good to happen to you today. <laughs> Probably something bad to test what you just heard <laughs> for the test. No, you can't be legalistic and you guard against that. But you stay with, and your plan, you come up with your plan. I've shared with you tonight an old, old one, an ancient one that uh, has uh, been tried and, and true. Okay, someone else before we go? Anyone? Before I turn it back over to Pastor Jason, come on. Okay, there may be another question and you get it. Thank you for the time. God oh, bless man. you. <laughs> well, what a joy and a delight to be encouraged. Uh, Pastor Bubba, you have uh, an incredible encouragement to you uh, that, is, uh, that is not only uh, endearing, but it, it greatly stirs up our faith and it hmm. reminds us of the faithfulness of God. And uh, it, it encourages us to, uh, uh, to press on and to be renewed. So uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to, or for you to bear fruit amongst us because, because it, it bears fruit for the Lord. So let's pray and then we're dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that you meet us in prayer and that you meet us in your word and that you've given us promises and uh, that you long for us to pray your promises back to you and, and that uh, just like that beautiful illustration that you long for us to come alongside uh, in fellowship and in prayer and to participate in your kingdom work that you have made us uh, uh, in your image to be able to participate uh, and, and Father forgive us whenever we uh, uh, we limit that, and when we get so distracted, uh, we do pray that you would teach us your ways. Uh, teach us your ways and, and allow us to grow spiritually, uh, and we thank you for such a practical application of that this evening uh, through your servant, Bubba. Uh, may you bless him and show him and Beth a tremendous favor uh, all of his days, God. You, you know the number of days that have been written uh, and your book of life for them. And, and we pray that you would continue to give them strength and vigor and vitality uh, to be used for your kingdom. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.